So, uh, so anybody online? We're here at uh, Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. Um, we're sitting with all the students and professors for the uh, term session for the summer. So this is in week three of a five-week term. The students don't look quite exhausted yet, but they're they're getting there. It looks like it. I'm not seeing any tears at the moment right now. Um, so happy to have everybody, and again online. So we have uh, the pleasure of an, another research lecture, as usual. But tonight we had two guest lectures because today was also uh, Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Laboratory harmful algal bloom forecast. And so um, we have some uh, guests here today that we'll introduce here in a little bit um, that did some speaking on harmful algal blooms and, and what the forecast looks like for um, the year that we're in. But I have the pleasure to start us off introducing our research lecture for tonight, and it's Dr. Justin Chaffin. He's the research coordinator for our program for Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory. Uh, Justin has, actually has a long history up at Stone Lab before being hired as the, the research coordinator. In 2005-2006, uh, he took courses up, in, up here at Stone Lab. In 2006, he was in our research experience for undergraduates program. Um, pretty exciting because Justin is, uh, actually was able to get a publication um, out, of his, out of his work that he did for that REU while he was up here. Um, after undergrad um, at Bowling Green State University is where you did your undergrad, is that correct? And then uh, went to University of Toledo where he grabbed his uh, master's and his PhD working with uh, Dr. Tom Bridgman. Uh, very excited to have Justin on staff. Um, clearly one of the um, well-known and recognized researchers working on Lake Erie, specifically on nutrient issues and harmful algal blooms. So when we talk about that issue and what we can do, um, not only in Ohio, but in Michigan, Indiana, and in and, and our neighboring um, Canada, to address this problem, Justin is clearly recognized as, as one of the experts and, and a go-to resource. And so it's exciting to have him on staff. Um, he's got many grants right now. He's working, I think you've got five separate grants somewhere in that area right now, Justin, you're working? Five or seven. Um, and one of the ones, not that they're not all important, Justin, but one of the ones that Justin has right now is, is through the EPA, and it's to work with charter captains um, in Lake Erie. And what Justin has done is, is train them how to collect a water sample that we can then take into our water quality lab, which Justin manages and runs and analyzes that, that information. Actually, going to be some data. Good, some data in here. And so I won't steal that thunder, but one of the things that I definitely want to say is not only is it important to, to have that partnership because those charter captains are covering parts of the lake that we couldn't get to with our own vessels and the frequency that they do. So that's critically important to have that, that data. But it's also showing that the stakeholders, the charter captain industry, is interested in this healthy lake. And so what you see is when this charter captain pulls up to a site, drops anchor, and gives fishing poles to all of his clients, at that same time he's getting a big sampling tube and reaching into the water and taking the water. <coughs> and as soon as those clients see that activity, they ask, you know, what's going on? And so it opens up that door to educate people on the importance of, of that sampling and the importance of, you know, monitoring Lake Erie to address the harmful algal critical issue. So I don't want to take any more of your time, Justin, um, but as we usually ask for our not only our research speaker, but our guest speakers, kind of give a little glimpse on where they started their career at and how they got to where they got. A lot of our audience right now is students that might see individuals that speak at these lecture series and say, that's the job I want. And we want to be able to give you kind of an insight on, on what route it might take to get to that point. And Justin, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Chris. Uh, so kind of my path into, into Stone Lab, um, uh, well, I, I always had an interest in Lake Erie because I grew up about seven miles south of the lake in a small town called Collins, and I always did a lot of fishing on the lake. Um, uh, I started taking classes up here in 2005 because I saw a little flyer at Fireland College of BGSU and thought it would be fun. So I signed up, got in. The next year, came back to do an RU. Did with Dr. Kane. He taught me how to make donuts. <laughs> or his, at his, uh, um, what he calls doing research. Uh, he, we're making donuts, but that was the expression. Some some old Dunkin' Donuts commercial or something like that. Time to make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. Uh, that, re that, that research led me into, into graduate school at University of Toledo, and, uh, and then I got in looking at, at, at the role of nitrogen in these blooms uh, because there was a big debate in literature. And right when I was finishing up my master's, there's a couple of new papers out saying 
phosphorus isn't all that important for nitrogen. So like, I thought, well, what better way to get into a PhD research? Because you know, basically this question was already being asked for me, and I thought, well, let's see if it works for Lake Erie. Uh, so as research coordinator at Stone Lab, uh, I kind of extended my the role of nitrogen, looking at how it affects toxicity of these blooms. And Kevin told me, the reason why I've been flicking back and forth, if you, if you stand up here talking too long on one slide, it's going to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my presentation is all about these nasty, harmful algal blooms. But, but most algae are not bad. They're, algae are tiny plant-like organisms. And algae produce about 50% of the Earth's oxygen. So basically, every other breath you take, you can take, thank algae. Uh, the algae are at the base of the food web. Like these good algae uh, you know, have algae that are, that are consumed by, by, a, by small shrimp-like creatures we call zooplankton. These zooplankton are preyed upon by small fish, and then walleye eat the, the small fish and so forth. And there are over hundreds of species of algae in the lake. And they come in many different sizes, shapes, colors. Uh, but in general, they all pretty much do the same thing. They take sunlight, nutrients, carbon dioxide, and they, they make food and oxygen. However, too much of the wrong type of algae is harmful. And we use the word harmful algal bloom. The way I define harmful algal bloom is harmful it has the ability, has the potential to produce toxins, as evidenced in the mosquito crisis last year, but also has harmful impacts on the ecosystem. Algal, uh, you can have uh, algal blooms that are, are or cyanobacteria, or, or also, also called blue-green algae. This would be a, this picture up here. Uh, someone hit the yeah. hit a light. But there's also harmful algal blooms in marine systems, and these are mostly associated with, with, with red tides, or, or what would you, um, you can see down here. And bloom, there's no scientific definition of the word bloom, but it's the, the biomass that exceeds what's normal. And these harmful algal blooms are a global problem. Anywhere you have people throwing in excess nutrients, you're going to grow algae. Um, these extra excess nutrients can come from fertilizers, manure, lawn care, sewage. Uh, basically, whatever surrounding a lake is most likely going to be the problem. If you have poor sewage and millions and millions of people, it's probably that's probably the, the, the cause. If your lake surrounded by agriculture, the problem will likely be called by agriculture. And basically, if it grows plants, it will grow algae in the water. So these Lake Harry harmful algal blooms, uh, the ones that we, we most talk about are is, is a type of cyanobacteria called microcystis. Uh, they're also, also called blue-green algae. Um, these cyanobacteria technically are not algae, but they're bacteria. So when they were first discovered you know, way back in the day when people started looking at drops of water under a microscope, they saw these blue-green, and they knew what algae were, so they called them blue-green algae. But then we later learned that they're actually bacteria, but we still call them blue-green algae. And they require sunlight like algae. And microcystis produces the toxin microcystin uh, responsible for the total water crisis. And uh, this is what one looks like under a microscope. It doesn't look blue-green under a microscope because they have a lot of gas vacuoles, and that gas, gas vacuoles block light from passing through. So under a microscope, they look black. Now, so that Toledo water crisis was a weekend without safe water. I believe it was uh, uh, August 1st or August 2nd. It was, it was a Saturday morning into a Monday. Um, I was actually up here teaching a one-week class, and um, at Saturday at 2 a.m., I got a text message from, from Ohio EPA asking if I had more, um, more materials to, to test for uh, microcystin. And I wasn't paying attention. Like, it's 2 a.m., why are you te texting me this? <laughs> <laughs> and then I got another one at 6 a.m. says, Pluto's under a water ban. I'm like, oh, that's what that was about. <laughs> but it's about half a million people without safe water. Um, all Toledo area hospitals canceled surgeries. You know, so that's a human health impact. Um, all businesses downtown were closed. They treated it like a level three snow emergency. You know, you can't serve pop because you dilute your pop with water. You know, 
business is closed, and the city of Toledo spends about an extra $10,000 per day to treat water during these blooms. Uh, so that's you know nearly a million dollars of extra money just wasted to give us. Well, I guess it's not wasted, but you know, if there was no blooms, they wouldn't be spending that money. Uh, so, so now to get into why these blooms occur in the first place, there's a, this general paradigm in limnology that that phosphorus is uh, the main culprit, and uh, during the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of experiments on, on uh, blooms, uh, trying to determine is it carbon or is it phosphorus. Uh, this is a, a experiment in Lake 227 in the Experimental Lakes region in, in Ontario. Uh, it's shaped like a figure eight, and in the center, uh, the scientist David Schindler, he divided it with a curtain to the top half, he had a carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and a dense algal bloom through. The bottom half, carbon, added carbon, added nitrogen, no phosphorus, no algal bloom. So experiments like this and many other experiments pinpointed phosphorus as being important. And if you've seen any news today about Lake Erie, we base our forecast on phosphorus loading. Uh, so using the, the phosphorus loading from the Maumee River, we uh, have models that predict the size of the bloom, and this year's bloom is, I think, 8.7 is what they're saying. So we're between 8 and almost 10. So we're going to have a pretty big bloom based on phosphorus loads. Uh, and we get a lot of phosphorus coming in in wet years, when it's extremely wet like it's been this year. But there's also drought years. Uh, so this is a, some data that we just recently published. Uh, Dr. Beatty is a co-author in this paper. Uh, really looking at three years of uh, wet versus drought years. And you can see the years here. Um, on the x-axis on the bottom is Maumee River discharge uh, March through June. That initially was the critical period for bloom formation. In 2012, very little water entered the river or entered the lake from Maumee River because of the drought. 2011, extremely wet year. And then you can look at the total nitrogen loads and the total phosphorus loads associated. So when you have a wet year, we're getting a lot of phosphorus, but we're also getting a lot of nitrogen. When you have a drought, you're getting very little phosphorus, but you're also getting a lot less nitrogen. So it's really hard to tease apart if you're just looking at this empirical data, what's driving these blooms. But we know from models and previous experiments, phosphorus is important. Um, I'm, I'm, I focus on what's the role of this nitrogen. Um, so, so why can nitrogen be important for cyanobacteria bloom? Well, a toxin, microcystin, well, microcystin is a toxin responsible to the water crisis. <laughs> that toxin is 14% nitrogen by mass. It, it's an amino acid compound. Um, all these ends up here represent a nitrogen atom. So this toxin is 14% 14 per, 14 nitrogen. Whereas if you look at microcystis, inside its cell is only 7% nitrogen by mass. So it's expensive in terms of nitrogen to make this toxin. And microcystis cannot grow or cannot make microcystin without some sort of combined nitrogen. It needs nitrate, it needs urea, it needs ammonia, amino, amino acid. It cannot do nitrogen fixation like some cyanobacteria. And we also know from, from the molecular biology that gene expression for, for nitrate or for, for nitrogen uptake genes and for microcystin production is controlled by the same promoter. So when this uh, uh, protein called NTCA is around, it's telling the genes to start looking for nitrogen, start scavenging for nitrate. And it's also at the same time telling it to produce microcystin. So when it's sucking up nitrate, it's also producing microcystin. It's, uh, it's down to the genetic level. Uh, but however, not all microcystis has all these genes. Only about 10% of the microcystis in Lake Erie 
has every 10 of these genes, and, then, and they need all 10 of these genes to produce microcystins. So if they have all 10 genes and they're sucking up nitrate, they're also making micro microcystins. And we know uh, from recent research that, that during bloom conditions, nitrogen constrains biomass. So not only are they not producing microcystins, they're also growing less. And how and we do these experiments where we add phosphorus and where we add nitrogen or we add them both together and we see high, highest biomasses when we add phosphorus and nitrogen together. Um, I, for my PhD, I did this in Lake Erie, um, but a lot of others looking and many other lakes around the world. Lake Taihu in China is uh, kind of like their Lake Erie, but it's a lot worse. It's a much smaller lake surrounded by think about the same number of people, but they're all putting in raw sewage and then they're not even attempting to drink from that water. They used to, they, they stopped drinking that water in like 2010. They're just assuming that it's loaded with microsystems. Uh, many researchers now call for management of both phosphorus and nitrogen to prevent blooms. Uh, unlike phosphate, or phosphorus, which just occurs as phosphate, PO4, nitrogen, occurs in many different forms. Nitrate, ammonia, organic forms such as urea, amino acid. And most types of algae can assimilate all these different sources of nitrogen. So if you give them nitrate, they can grow on nitrate. If you give them ammonia, they can grow on ammonia. Uh, so here's what I was talking about. Uh, you know, we have, a, this is Maumee Bay water, uh, 2011 from September or August. Here's a control. You give it phosphorus, nothing really happens. You give it nitrogen, and they, they really take off. You put phosphorus and nitrogen together, um, you get even a little bit higher biomass. So this happens in August and September of every year. If when you do this in June and July, if phosphorus is a limiting factor, giving it nitrogen doesn't do much. So in late summer, nitrogen really plays a role in biomass. And just recently, early this winter, the US EPA put out this little note saying, uh, here's some scientific support for dual nutrient criteria. So we need to look at nitrogen and phosphorus. And the nitrogen cycle is much more complicated than the phosphorus cycle. Um, you have nitrogen entering in from a river in all these different forms, like flushing down a river. Um, once that nitrogen gets into a river or into a lake, it can be assimilated uh, by algae, and algae can, or other organisms, bacteria, zooplankton, can excrete ammonia and urea that can get uh, oxidized and returned. So there's all these different cycling of nitrogen in the water column and from the sediment. You also get nitrogen coming from the rainwater. This graph doesn't even talk about nitrogen fixation, but that's another way nitrogen can get into a system. Whereas phosphorus, it's only coming down the river. Uh, <clears throat> near, uh, near shore, we see nitri nitrate concentration exceeding 100 micromolar. Um, and uh, ammonia is recycled at a rate of of 2.5 micromole per liter per hour in Lake Taihu. So these are two numbers I kind of want to want you to uh, pay attention to. So we have extremely high nitrate concentrations following rain rainstorms, and, but yeah, we always had this background recycling of uh, ammonia at uh, oh, 2.5 micromole per hour. And human activities are increasing the amount of available nitrogen to ecosystems. Uh, there's a lot of literature out showing uh, the diamonds here show the amount of nitrogen fertilizer use increasing you know, from the 60s to present day. And the bars represent uh, uh, how much of that is urea. So not only are we using more nitrogen, we're shifting the forms of nitrogen we're using from uh, uh, nitrate based to urea based. A lot of this is being done because uh, nitrate is used in explosives, whereas urea is 
much more easy to get. So my research question is how is this increasing nitrogen use going to affect Lake Erie and these blooms? And for this experiment we did last summer, we looked at three forms of nitrogen, nitrate, ammonia, and urea, and three loading rigs. A single high pulse, which represents like what happens after a storm, and a low sustained pulse, which represents uh, internal recycling. And I also wanted to show some uh, data from Western Lake Erie of nitrate concentration decreasing. So the black line, well, this uh, on the left is Maumee Bay, on the right is uh, near West Sister Island, which you can kind of see sometimes in the clear, clear day if you look out to the west. For 2010 and 2011, we see this decreasing nitrate concentration. Uh, high dissolved phosphorus concentration uh, in May and June, lower in midsummer. So, well, last summer we did we did three of these experiments. Uh, the first one is in Sandusky Bay, which uh, is not microcystis, but uh, a uh, filamentous cyanobacteria called Planktothrix also produces microcystin. And then we did two with microcystin, one in Maumee Bay uh, a couple days after the water crisis, and one late, later in September, just right out here by, by the Bass Island. And I also want to point out the, the starting biomass. So one way, we, one way limnologists measure algae biomass is looking at the concentration of chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A is a pigment that's in, it's in leaves, it's in grass, it's in crops. It's a pigment that starts, that absorbs sunlight and starts photosynthesis. So there's more chlorophyll in the water. We assume that means there's more algae in the water. So for this Planktothrix experiment, we had uh, starting chlorophyll A's of 165. This is super green water, and you'll see a picture of it in a second. The first microcystis was at 86, and another uh, the one out by the islands was at 18. So we have a, I'm calling this a planktothrix experiment, and then a dense microcystis bloom and a small bloom of microcystis. So, so the experiment we do, we, you know, you always have your control where you just look at baseline. Uh, had a phosphorus treatment where I added one micromole at the beginning of the experiment. Then I had a single high dose of nitrate, ammonia, and urea. This was 100 micromole at the beginning of the experiment. This represents that flush of nitrogen following a rainstorm. And then I had uh, low continuous doses of nitrate, ammonia, urea, where we added 8.3 micromole of nitrogen for every four hours. So, so every four hours we go and add a little bit of nitrogen. And when you, do, when you divide that by four hours, you get a, that simulates an internal recycling rate of, of 2.07 micromole per liter per hour, which matches the study in Lake Taihu. And when you add all this nitrogen up for over, for over a period of 48 hours, the amount of nitrogen added in these low sustained doses equals 100. So here's the Sandusky Bay water. We, we did these in bottles. The yeah, incubation ran for 48 hours. Growth chamber was set to light levels and water temperature at collection. For the Sandusky Bay, you can see how, how green they are. And here's a, one of my RUs last year, Ren, doing, uh, doing the nutrient additions at the beginning of the experiment. So some measurements from these bottles. Uh, we did microcystin at the beginning and the end of the experiment. We looked at total and extracellular microcystis or microcystin. Did chlorophyll at uh, initial and final, dissolved nutrients at initial and final. And uh, we also got samples to look at um, microcystin gene expression. And we got uh, samples that start one hour, four hour, eight hour, and 48 hours. And these are being analyzed, these are still in progress. Um, these are being analyzed by, by researchers up at Noel Plural in Ann Arbor. Uh, this data will tell us you know, how fast are these 
nutrients uh, or how fast these genes are being turned on or turned off. Uh, you know, how much nitrogen do they need to be turned on or turned off? Is there is there a delay? You give them a high pulse. When does that gene expression turn off or turn on? So there's a lot of a lot of questions we'll be able to answer with this with this molecular data. So, so get into some of the results. You're going to see a series of graphs that all look pretty similar. Um, on the x-axis are, are the treatments. The black bar is the initial, and all the gray bars are after 48 hours of incubation. You have a control, phosphorus, and then the next three are the single high nitrate ammonia and urea, and then the low, low continuous nitrate ammonia and urea. The bars are uh, a mean of uh, three replicates with, the, with standard air bars, and the letters above the bars are re results of a Tukey test. So this is for chlorophyll A in the Sandusky Bay experiment, uh, which is Planck-Citrix. Uh, you see the initial levels declined a little bit, but the control and phosphorus were, were uh, identical. Then when you give them nitrogen, Nitrogen increased biomass, but there was really no difference among nitrogen form or dose rate. And there's really no pattern you can tease out here. This was for the plank Planck experiment. And then you look at microcystin, the toxin. Um, and I have this little picture over here to help remind me what I'm talking about, either biomass or microcystin. So you can see the control and phosphorus, pretty similar to the initial. But if you give them any form of nitrogen, they're going to make more toxins. Uh, there's really no difference between the dose rates. So the, the single high versus the low sustained have the same pattern. But among the nitrogen, the ammonia ones have the lowest microcystin. So they're producing more, mi mi more microcystin with nitrate and urea. Now we'll get into the microcystin dense bloom. Um, again, we see the control and phosphorus, not, you know, seeing no response there. But you give them any form of nitrogen, they're going to grow. So with microcystis, we're seeing more growth with ammonia. And again, no really, pa no distinct pattern versus uh, the difference in loading rate. You see the microcystis floating at the top. You look at microcystin for the uh, microcystin. In the dense bloom, again, any form of nitrogen you give them, they're going to make a little bit more toxin. But they're making lower amounts of microcystin when you give it ammonia. And again, no pattern of low sustain or versus high, a single high pulse. Look at the small bloom, we get a, a much more clear results with the small bloom when you're starting with less biomass. Again, you give it any sort, any form of nitrogen. They really take off. But again, we see highest biomasses with ammonia. But then we see the lowest microcystin with ammonia. Okay. Again, no, no pattern of loading form. Uh, so I'm going to show some, so that was all experimental data. Now I'm going to show some data that. Uh, some data that the charter boat captains have been collecting for me. This is from 2014 data. Uh, uh, each week, six captains go out and they collect a sample wherever they're fishing. Um, there's some captains like to go to the same spot all the time. Some captains will uh, sample wherever they're finished fishing. Um, so each week, these six captains, sometimes you know, only get six or sometimes I'll get four or five samples a week. But in, you know, but in general, we always, we're always getting about six samples per week. After they finish, we drive around, we pick it up, and we bring it back to the lab, and we analyze it. And this project is, has been funded by the Howe EPA for the last three years. Um, this year, it's funded by the Environmental Education Fund. <coughs> and, and each week, the, the captains get like a little update on the data they collect. So these are graphs from last year's, the final update last year. And, and how I plot it is uh, 
first date, and uh, the red is the maximum value from those six samples for that given sample date, and the blue is the average. Uh, so on the top graph is algae biomass, that's chlorophyll A, and we see uh, chlorophyll A really peaked in early August, and then kind of tapers down. If we look at microcystin, we see a high peak in early August, which corresponds with the Pluto water crisis. So then it rapidly drops down. And by the end of, uh, by the end of August, it's pretty much at this, a very low level. If you look at algae biomass in uh, end of August and September, it's still at a fairly high, high uh, level. Then if we look at, on the bottom, the nitrate concentration, we, again, we really see this nitrate drop off. Phosphorus is pretty much stable throughout the year. So these, uh, this data kind of shows that this decrease, uh, this decrease in nitrate kind of explains why we see almost very low microcystin levels in uh, late in the second half of the bloom. And other researchers um, have observed this very similar pattern last year. When they're going to fixed sites, they're seeing this exact same pattern that, that the, the charter captain saw, basically almost sampling wherever they wanted to. And again, these, these results are supported by the experiment. Uh, so a summary of, of these results. Uh, these blooms are nitrogen limited. No response was seen to phosphorus enrichment. Uh, dose rate of, mic of nitrogen did not affect algae biomass nor microcystin. The form of nitrogen did not affect plankton growth. Uh, this matches a similar study that I did in 2012 where um, I gave a Sandusky Bay water varying levels of nitrogen and they, um, there were isotope, stable isotope nitrogen 15 studies and we saw no matter what form you give plankton strikes, it's sucking it all up. Uh, ammonia resulted in the highest microcystis growth and the dense bloom and the small bloom responded the same which gives me more confidence in saying that ammonia really stimulates microcystis. However, for both cyanobacteria, ammonia resulted in the lowest microcystin concentration of those nitrogen treatments. And this gets back to the molecular biology that um, I showed you that slide of, of uh, the gene operon and NTCA being around being a promoter. Well, ammonia inhibits the NTCA promoter. So when ammonia is around, that promoter is not doing its job, then cyanobacteria is not going to use nitrate and it's not going to make microcystin. And, and and the molecular samples that we have or that are being analyzed will will validate hopefully this statement that I just made. And the the, the microcystic concentrations <coughs> decreased as nitrogen concentrations decreased. Yet microcystis was still able to remain at a high biomass. And it's likely due to that it is very competitive for low concentrations of ammonia. So, so some implications for this dual, mass, dual nutrient management. Um, I want to stress that these results do not discount the importance of phosphorus. Uh, in, in the literature or, or even some meetings, I guess there's like a, a, a side that's pro-phosphorus and a side that's pro-nitrogen. Well, the pro-phosphorus people think that the pro-nitrogen people are saying phosphorus doesn't matter at all. That's not the case, at least some of them. Um, <laughs> I, I'm on the side that it's, you know, phosphorus is important. And if we, we didn't have phosphorus in the waters, we would not have the bloom. Uh, but we know that nitrogen <coughs> constrains the growth of blooms during these bloom conditions. So when you have these really dense blooms. Within the bloom, it's nitrogen. And it's even constraining the amount of toxin those blooms are making. Uh, you know, these blooms are able to assemble multiple forms of nitrogen. 
therefore, nitrogen management is should be considered. Uh, uh, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen management should consider all forms of nitrogen if you're going to practice <coughs> nitrogen regulation. You can't just say let's focus on nitrate because then people will shift urea. That could cause you know, won't have anything. You, there'll be no result. So you have to target all forms of nitrogen. And you can't just target a total nitrogen concentration because some say, well, we lowered the total nitrogen concentration, but now we just shifted it all to urea. So you need to look at all forms. Um, these blooms reach the same biomass under both loading regimes. Uh, so the recycling, recycling, nitrogen, uh, recycling of nitrogen at, at, at 2 micromole per liter per hour can support a bloom, at least in the short term. Therefore, that store that stored nitrogen that's in the system that's being recycled, that will need to be depleted before any external nitrogen load reductions have any impact. However, we do not know how long this will be. Okay. We don't know if there's a one week supply, if there's a one month supply, one year, decade, we, we, we really don't know. And nitrogen enters the lake through more vectors than just the Maumee River. There, there's atmospheric deposition, internal recycling, uh, nitrogen fixation. So the nitro controlling nitrogen, managing nitrogen is a much more difficult question rather than it coming down the river, coming from everywhere. So, so uh, some future plans and other research that's needed on the nitrogen front. Uh, this summer we're going to look at the effects of nitrogen the form of nitrogen at light level. One of my RUs, students, Michaela, was going to do these experiments in Sandusky Bay, uh, but it rained a lot and nitrate concentrations are over 500 micromolar. So any any additional nitrogen we give them is not going to matter. So we have to wait for nitrogen to come down to study the effects of it. Um, we need a better nitrogen budget. We, uh, you know. Uh, we, we don't know the ammonia generation rate, regeneration rate. Uh, we, we, we don't know that rate. Uh, we need a quantify, you know, better quantification of, uh, of uh, uh, more nitrogen processes. You know, the, we, we don't know the nitrification rates. We don't know how much denitrification is it occurring, how much, where is it occurring. Uh, we, uh, not much has been done on nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixing blooms. Uh, they, they tend to appear late in summer in Maumee Bay. Um, uh, we don't know how much nitrogen they're adding, if at all. Uh, and also, we don't know really know the assimilation rates of uh, nitrate, ammonia, and urea. Uh, and then from the, on the models, uh, I think a lot of work can a lot of questions can be solved with models. But in order to model it, you need to know all this stuff up here. Uh, so the question I have, can nitrate concentration be modeled? If you're at the second part of the HAB forecast, you saw the Limnotech models, which can accurately measure phosphorus concentration at any point in the lake at any time. Can that be done for, nit for nitrate? If you can do that for nitrate, then you might be able to predict microcystin concentration. And then these models can, could possibly use to test uh, you know, for the Annex 4 stuff that you'll hear in the second presentation, it's all based on phosphorus load reductions. And the models say if we reduce phosphorus by 20%, by 40%, by 60%, this is what the lake will look like. Well, what if we ran those phosphorus load reductions with a concurrent load of nitrogen reductions? What will be the impact? Uh, but I feel like in order to accurately model that, we need to know all these rates within Lake Erie. And I don't know if they're if they're being measured at, at all or, or what, but so some other research projects that uh, we've been working on quickly to finish up. Uh, one project we're doing this summer is uh, um, looking at the Sandusky Bay bloom. Uh, it's just a plankton search bloom. It's pretty much a shallow cesspool. There's always cyanobacteria in the lake in Maumee Bay. But it doesn't spill out and directly out the lake. It kind of hugs the shoreline. So every week we're sampling in red. These red dots are where we're sampling. 
and Bowling Green and Kent State University are sampling along the shoreline. And this is a, uh, we're doing this because this plankton circus bloom, as you saw, it can be very dense, but it also produces toxins. And there's a lot of drinking water intakes all throughout the south shore of Ohio. And that's where plankton circus comes out. It just hugs the shoreline. So we're sampling those weekly. And along, I should say that is now being funded by the Ohio Department of Higher Education. They just changed their name, I guess. Um, uh, we're, uh, part of that project, we're also putting buoys out. Uh, we, uh, July 1st, we helped Bowling Green State University put their buoy out, which is located right there. Our buoy is located right there, or right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one project we're working on with our buoy is that we're sampling by this buoy uh, several times a week uh, to collect a water sample because these buoys cannot measure microcystin. They cannot measure nutrients. Uh, so one of the goals is to see if any parameters from the buoy can be used to predict microcystin or phosphorus concentrations or, or anything. You know, just see if there's correlations between uh, sensor and water sample. And all that buoy data goes online. Uh, and if I exit this, will it mess stuff up? Uh, just minimize it. Minimize it? Oh, okay. Well, if you go to this website, there's all these, there's uh, several buoys in Lake Erie. And you can click on them, and then you can click on any parameter and a graph will appear. Am I allowed to, am I allowed to copy? No. Let me do, let me do this one quick. Yeah, that'll work. So if you go to that website, then there's this launch, launch this tool, and then that map that I just showed loads up, and we can click on our buoy. There it is. And then say if you want to look at uh, look at water temperature. <coughs> Thinking. There, and there's a there's water temperature sent. May or since July 4th, let's change this to June 4th. And there, then there's water temperature. So you, you can do this with all these different parameters uh, you know, from each buoy. And all the data is somewhere here. You can, this is like only the third time I've looked at this website because it was just launched yesterday. Well, you can get all the data from these buoys, download it, export it into Excel, and do your own calculations with it. So that's kind of cool. So this one, Kevin. And then this. So our buoy is actually was donated to us last year by by Fondrice Environmental, which is a company that sells buoys and water quality equipment um, located near Dayton, Ohio. Another project that uh, just got word it's going to be funded is uh, looking at can these water pitchers remove microcystin. So you, know, you get questions like, does my braider pitcher, or does my pure pitcher, does it remove microcystin? Well, I, I don't know. Let's test it. That's uh, so we're going to be start start doing this research later this summer, and we're going to look at at uh, solutions of pure microcystin and also uh, bloom extracted microcystin. Uh, we also monitor the water uh, uh, island communities for microcystin in their drinking water. So every Tuesday, the water plant operators bring us samples 
We test it for microcystin. We report it back to the EPA and say, yep, your water's fine. Continue to drink. And finally, we've uh, we've been doing a really good job of recovering your lost balloons. <laughs> so for, so far this summer, we found 14 balloons, and we traveled approximately 700. Uh, as of like last when we last saw our last balloon, 772 kilometers. That's approximately one balloon every 53 kilometers. <laughs> that's just this year. So if you, I didn't want to do the extrapolations. But you can imagine there's a lot of boon in Lake Erie. We passed a whole bunch of other Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, so and there's a, you know, funding from Ohio Tea Grant, Friends of Stone Lab, Ohio EPA, uh, lab assistance from uh, Bree Zellner, who was uh, my assistant last year. Uh, Karen Otega was a DRU student that worked on this project last year. Eller Stone Lab. Staff Tim Davis, who was here in the morning, and other NOAA girl staff for doing the RNA samples. Thank you. Thank you. Time for a couple questions for Justin. Um, so, the inverted problem muscles are really good at recycling ammonia. Has anybody in the literature looked at experiments with? Uh, ammonia regeneration from them and the effect of toxicity of uh, microcystin and microcystis that, that, that decreases the toxicity. Well, I, I know there's a study done by you and colleagues that looked at nitrogen, right, with Conroy. Yeah, but we didn't look at effect on microcystis or microcystin. Right, but it, it's not going to, uh, the algae is not going to matter where the ammonia comes from. Or where the nitrogen, or where, where the phosphorus come from. If it gets in the lake, it's going to use it. Um, uh, so there, there's really no uh, there's no direct correlation between uh, or or any studies that I'm aware of that that looked like that. But there has been studies that say when the zebra mussel gets into a, a smaller lake, that less phosphorus is needed to support that. That growth, but there was also a paper just published, not just a pop in my head, that uh, showed that zebra mussels do not influence uh, microcystin quota for microcystis cells. Oh, okay. So, if there's zebra mussels present or not, the microcystis is still going to produce as much microcystin as it wants to. Dang, that's going to be a good project for next year. <laughs> Real quick, Justin, we, we were sort of speculating on the importance of uh, atmospheric loading of nitrogen and it, sort of two pieces of this. It would seem to make, make sense that atmospheric loading of nitrogen would be more important on, on Lake Erie, say, than Lake, any of the other Great Lakes versus depth to volume. We have more surface area to depth. So Nitrogen loading on or atmospheric nitrogen. No. I, I don't know what, but this area of uh, the Midwest receives the most atmospheric deposition of nitrate. And if that's, you know, if you get a rainstorm that has high concentration of nitrate, uh, I don't know off the top of my head concentration of nitrate, but uh, microcystis doesn't need a lot of nitrate to get going. Just a, a few micromolar will. Increase its biomass. They were speculating that atmospheric loading might be 40% of the uh, total amount of nitrogen. That would be quite a lot. And then again, if you're someone that's trying to regulate nitrogen, you know, is looking at nitrogen coming down the river the best way to do it? I would argue no. So it's not going to be. Well, it's just, you can't point your your finger at farmers for for nitrogen because it's coming from everywhere. Whereas, you know, we can point our finger at farmers in the Maumee Bay, or the Maumee River Basin for phosphorus because we know it pretty much is coming from there. So if you're going to try to reduce nitrogen, any suggestions? It's a, it's a, a global deal, and it's multiple sources. So, so burning, burning of fossil fuels, 
producing amount of ammonia fertilizers, nitrate fertilizers. You uh, assume the general tenet of phosphorus limitation. Okay, it's going to be should be phosphorus limited all the time. But but when you have a growth throughout the summer, the nitrate nitrate concentration is being depleted. Ammonia is always being sucking up. But you're also losing nitrogen from a system from a system through denitrification, which is the process that takes nitrate NO3 converts it to N2 gas. And then that gas leaves the system. So it's a combination of uptake and growth and also loss from the system. Is that occasionally happen for trees? No, it happens it happens the entire throughout probably happens more frequently in the, or at a higher rate in the summer because of temperature. But in the early spring or spring, early summer, you get a huge pulse of nitrogen flushing in from, from the rivers. Another question um, is that why is microsystem not removed by conventional wastewater treatment? Uh, you mean drinking water, or yeah? Well, it, it is. So why was there a an emergency? Uh, because they they weren't expecting. A any sort of bloom at that time, and they, they were uh, they, they they measure microcystin daily, uh, but their intake is towards the bottom. Okay. If it's calm, all the microcystis is going to be at the top, and then uh, if you get some wind, it mixes up. They didn't they didn't have the sensors that they have now, so they weren't ready for it, and they were using much lower levels of uh, um, uh, it's called activated carbon. Yeah. When there's more, you know, when they when they know there's more stuff in the water, they put more carbon in. Well, they weren't using much, and they weren't ready for it. Now this year, now they have all these sensors for biomass, you know, in the intake part, out in the lake, at the in, uh, in their uh, the first stage where the water is actually coming in the pipe. They have that data. They have they know the amount of micro of microcystis coming into their plant, and it's like a two-hour ride from where it's coming in and where they start treatment. So they have, they can be ready for it. You know, they're paying attention you know, to to their sensors around the clock. They'll be able to know within at least within two hours. Maybe here comes the pulse of stuff. So let's get ready. Uh, that is a good question and a hard one to answer. Uh, if you're if you're planktophrix, it's not going to really matter for biomass, uh, but it might make less less micro microcystis. Uh, or for microcystis, it will get a much higher biomass, but it might make a little less toxin. Um, and now, if you're if you're only able to somehow magically control which form of nitrogen is in the water, and you could switch it to one form or another. That would be a, a, one experiment you could run. Uh, that we, you know, we don't know because there's always all this recycling of ammonia in the, in the water. So just going to make a quick question in the, the statement. We've got to yeah. kind of stop. The Justin will be available afterwards for questions. So can I come back to the, the, the water treatment one? Mm -hmm. So. What we use to take the toxin out, we know, UV or activated mm -hmm. carbon or potassium permanganate. But I guess to come back to that, it's not used all the time. It's actually they ramp that up yeah. during a detection cycle. So yeah. it's, that's the yeah. that's why when they said ten thousand dollars a day, because when they detect the toxin, that's something that they add that they wouldn't do as a baseline treatment. Yeah. 
And then the question I had for you, you had mentioned that there's 10 genes that are required. All 10 have to be there to produce the toxin. <clears throat> but then you also referenced the, the number of 10% of the actual microcystis contain those 10 genes. I'm curious, has anybody been checking to see, is that percentage of, of, of the population that carries the 10 genes changing through time? Uh, so there, there has been some work, and it seems pretty much to sustain at a low, low rate. Um, but that was well, not really all that recent data from like 2008, I believe, most recent I heard. Um, yeah, in other lakes, they, they've showed that the form of nitrogen con really controls the strain of microcystis that's out there. Uh, when you give one form of n nitrogen, you're shifting the microcystis community more towards nitrogen producing microcystis. If you give it more ammonia, you're shifting it back the other way. Um, but it's not always all that consistent. You know, it's not if they're going on ammonia, it's going to be 100% non-toxic. If they're going on nitrate, it's not, it's not going to be 100% toxic stream. And if you look at you know in the lake, there's it's complex. So it's always there's, there's always a mixed bag that's out there because there's always a lot of different forms of nitrogen out there. We think just a tremendous amount of good information. Thanks, Jess. <laughs> um, we're at uh, 8 o'clock right now. Why don't we take uh, five, ten minutes? We think just five, five minutes. If everybody could get back to her like a little bit, like five after six after. We get uh, started with the second, uh, second half of the evening's lectures. Uh, but before I bring up... Uh, Dr. Reuter to introduce our first guest uh, speaker tonight. I want to go around the room and kind of see how all the courses are going. Dr. Kane, do you have any announcements for your um, students? We're going to switch things a little different than what I told you. We're going to meet up here first and do a lecture and watch the film, and then we're going to do our data analysis. Jaws? Well, are we watching Jaws? What are we watching? No, we are watching Lorax. Oh, the original. Wow. Original. Good. Yeah, it's not the the dumb remake, but I love to see Danny DeVito in it. But other than that, it took all the, the rhyming out of it. So would I break or steal some of your thunder if I pulled the Lorax story related to Sea Grant? Have you told that story? That's what I'm going to tell. That's the sad to watch. Okay, so then I will keep my mouth shut. And we'll We're talking about you. Good. Good. Roger. Yes. Anything for your students? Oh, God. We, we, uh, we had our third field trip wiped out by the Okay. So instead of just sitting around twiddling our thumbs and staring at each other and identifying all the things we collected, we took off and went to the Cleveland uh, Aquarium. And uh, we got, uh, my fault, we got stuck in the freshwater section. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's like, there's like this, you know, there's this one room that's freshwater and I got going in the freshwater. We were in there most of the time, and then we went into the trough, into the Amazon and the coral reefs. And I go, there's a fish. There's a fish. Oh, keep moving, you know. <laughs> so I'm afraid my students didn't, didn't get to know much about marine stuff. But then we went to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, which was one reason why I was trying to move them on. And we got and we went behind the scenes with uh, Roberta Buhlheim who's a, a curator in the vertebrate section, and, uh, man, my students came alive. <laughs> she started showing them things like uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the marsupial wolf. She was showing the head of that. She was, like, tying all this bone structure into muscles and life history stuff, and they just, it was great. Is there anything left in either of these museums <laughs> after your students? <laughs> you didn't tell a single thing to go. The burners will, will brain you if you do that. So we were very, we behaved, and we went in to see, you know, everybody's learning how to pin insects. So we went into the insect collection so they could see how these curators are pinning insects, and, you know, as, as usual, inordinately impressive. So we all felt humble. By their skills, yeah, but I tell you what, I think it was uh, it, even though it wasn't planned, it might have.
say I'm a big museum guy, so but I would recommend getting your students behind the scenes in the museum. See what happens to all this stuff that they collect Good. that they send to museums. Yeah. So we had a great field trip today. Good. And I see no problem with spending all the time on fresh water. I see no problem. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree. Dr. Beatty. <laughs> uh, our, <laughs> our class has been uh, neck deep in the uh, same <coughs> stuff that Dr. Chapman just talked about. Um, we uh, actually just uh, analyzed some data the other day from our nutrient assay experiment that kind of similar to what Justin set up. We added a combination of nitrate and phosphate at different levels to see which would be uh, most stimulating to the growth uh, of the algae up there. We actually found uh, very limited uh, stimulation from our additions of nitrate and phosphorus. And we pondered about that for quite a while, but we uh, also recognized in our observations at that time that mostly what we had in our um, experiments turned out to be diatoms. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't gotten the actual data from, the nutrient data from that from that experiment yet. I think actually it's probably done. But from a subsequent experiment with my RU, we saw that the silicate concentrations were pretty close to the level that would limit the growth of diatoms. So right now, I'll just say we're probably limited to diatoms are being limited by silica. But looking at the water sample that Justin grabbed out of the lake today, the microsystems are starting to show up. And so the diatoms are probably going to make way for their nemesis, <laughs> our enemy, the blue green. Dr. Simon, any comments for your question? Uh, we have a, our first exam tomorrow. Uh, and the first practical is very, very well. Very impressive. I wonder what that smell was, but we got it now. I understand. Good. And then I know Dr. Marshall, he's uh, actively catching birds right now. I think. Watch out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah watch out for that. It's dark when you leave. We don't want it to be a missed up for humans. Good point, Good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think we're uh, really fortunate to ha uh, tonight to have uh, a person who's really become a good friend, uh, Tink Hyde from. Uh, U.S. EPA uh, Region 5, the uh, uh, office in Chicago for the Midwest uh, here as our speaker. I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, about Tinka and also uh, give you a little bit of a preface on the importance of this talk based on what we heard earlier today. So, uh, and Tinka, when you come up, uh, if you could uh, also provide a little bit of background about yourself, how you made the decisions that you did. And, and you've been at EPA now for 30 years, so so how did you make that first decision to get in there and, and work your way up to, uh, Pinka is the uh, water division director, so everything related to water goes through Pinka. Uh, and so it's an incredibly important position uh, when you think of the protect, all the issues that we have talked about, every issue that we that you will discuss while you are here at Stone Laboratory, goes through through Jenkins office <coughs> at Chicago. Started at Lake Superior State, went to uh, New Mexico, uh, New Mexico State. I'm sorry, I, I keep wanting to say New Mexico State. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I still name it. And. Uh, where I, I've run into Tinka in so many different capacities over the years, but where we have worked most closely together, uh, Tinka is the U.S. Chair for Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. You're also serving on several other annexes, aren't you? No. No, you're not. Okay, no. you're safe. Okay. I coordinate with that. Okay, good. Uh, annex 4 is the nutrient annex. When we look at the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, U.S. and Canada, Ten annexes. Uh, when I look at all of the, each one of the annexes is very, very important. But to me, when we think of the issues that we're focused on right now, I think Annex 4, where Tinka is, is the most important annex. 
Within that annex, we formed three subcommittees. I am the U.S. co-chair of a subcommittee that was focused at determining what's the correct amount, how, how much do we have to reduce phosphorus to solve these problems. But then we have two other task teams that are focused on what does agriculture have to do, what do community, what do the urban areas have to do, what, what is already being done, uh, and we're discussing next steps for each of us, which Tink is going to tell us a little bit about today. So Tink is going to come up in a second, and she's going to give us our targets, tell us what we need to do, U.S. and Canada, it's bi-national, so she, when I say she's the U.S. chair, she has a Canadian counterpart, Susan Humphreys in uh, Environment Canada. And today, what did we hear? Uh, first thing we heard was uh, Dr. Laura Johnson from Heidelberg University. Heidelberg tells us how much phosphorus, how much water really, but how much phosphorus comes in out of the Maumee River. And we use the load out of the Maumee River to predict the severity of the bloom. So how bad is the algae bloom going to be? So the first thing that Laura told us is something that you probably have all seen. Uh, we had a pretty large load of phosphorus coming in this year in March. We know that March to July is the critical period, pretty large load. Then it was dry for April and May. And so when we look at our forecast for how severe the bloom would be, by the end of May, everybody was feeling pretty good on a 1 to 10 scale, with 10 being the worst bloom possible, 1 being or 0 being no bloom at all. We were looking at a bloom that would probably have been a 3, uh, about what we would have had in 2012, which was a very low bloom year. 2011 was the worst bloom year ever. And then we had the month of June. Uh, and you have all been up here. You've experienced it. Roger, you can't get out every <laughs> single time it rains. Everybody, anyone who's tried to get into a river has experienced it. And during the month of June, the level of Lake Erie went up 11 inches, one level. Uh, we're now 16 inches above average for June's going back to 1918. And we're with it within 12 inches of the all-time high. So it's just amazing changes very, very quickly. Turns out that the discharge, the discharge for June was the uh, third largest discharge for any month ever, uh, going back to uh, 1930. And it was the largest discharge for the month of June, uh, the largest load of phosphorus to ever come in for the month of June, uh, and we went from a forecasted bloom of a three to a forecast for the second worst bloom that we've ever seen, a bloom that will be at least an 8.5 uh, and could be as almost as severe as the bloom of 2011. Uh, all happened within the last month, and unfortunately, it's still raining, uh, and so that's a, that's a big concern. So now. <laughs> the importance of the things that we're going to hear from Tinker. What do we have to do? What does the U.S. and Canada, what have we done, what have we said is, what would if we agreed on are the uh, reduced loads or the targets? What do we have to hit as a target to solve this problem? So with that as background, and again, Tinker, if you could start with a little background about yourself, please join me in welcoming Tinker High. Good evening. I, uh, just a little bit of history. I uh, studied geology, actually, so I am not a biologist. I am a rockhead geologist kind of person. Um, and as, um, as I finished my master's, I, I, I started on a PhD, and then at um, about a year into it, I decided, you know, I wanted to try something new. So I uh, actually heard about some opportunities at EPA. Um, when I first went to uh, geology school, um, I thought I would be working in either oil and gas or mining or something like that. But those um, areas uh, kind of tanked in the economic department. And so, and at the same time, the environmental uh, field was really just starting. 
And so EPA had some openings, and I started in the Underground Injection Control Program. I'm not sure if anybody knows too much about that program, but it is the program that regulates the disposal of waste underground. Most of it is related to oil and gas, but some of it is related to hazardous waste as well, and some of it is related to um, ways to dispose of uh, septic and, and things like that as well. So, um, and then after that, I, I moved over uh, a couple years into the Superfund program and was a project man manager for several years um, and really enjoyed it. Um, I found that I liked project management work. It was a lot of diversity, and I got to use my uh, geology degree, but I also got to learn a lot of other things. Um, about risk assessment, um, um, areas related to uh, biology and human health, and so and a little engineering in there as well. So, uh, and then from there, um, lo and behold, I never wanted to be in management or supervision, but there I went and um, enjoyed it. And I actually started uh, enjoying policy at, at the Environmental Protection Agency. We have a lot of policy issues that we deal with. And um, I found that really interesting as well. So those are some of the things that have formulated my career. I moved from Superfund into our enforcement program and, and coordinated our enforcement program for probably about 10 years. And then um, about eight years ago, I moved into the water division. So I kind of moved around in the agency. And um, uh, for me, it was good. I, I got a lot of different perspectives and learned a lot of different things. And so I am truly a jack of many trades and a master of none. Um, but I very much enjoy my work and I very much enjoy the variety that's out there. And so um, moving on to the topic at hand today, um, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, um, it was renegotiated in 2012 and part of the agreement had um, the nutrient annex, Annex 4, and it tasked us with several things. And so I was asked to co-chair this with Sue Humphreys from Environment Canada. And um, we, uh, over the last couple of years now, formed a subcommittee and um, started working on this effort. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the targets we're recommending, how we're going to go about um, making allocations for each country. Um, we are currently in a consultation phase, and so what uh, we've got going on in that. And I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the research that's going on related to um, phosphorus targets to address Cladophora, which is one of the issues in the Eastern Basin, and then give some examples of some of the actions that are actually going on right now, and then uh, focus on uh, what's next. So under um, the agreement, we had um, what are called lake ecosystem objectives, and those really were the, the direction to us that we needed to do um, the following things, minimize the extent of the low oxygen zone, Maintain a level of algal, um, algae below uh, nuisance conditions. Maintain algal species consistent with a health, healthy aquatic ecosystem. And then also maintaining um, cyanobacteria levels that don't produce concentrations of toxins that pose a threat to human health or the ecosystem. And then finally, we also had to make sure that we were maintaining the mesotrophic conditions in the open waters of the um, western and central basins, and then um, the oligotrophic conditions in the eastern basins. So we had a variety of things that we had to deal with. And as you can see on this chart, um, the, the various issues really do align fairly well with the different basins in the, in the lake. So the central basin really has a hypoxy, hypoxic issue of low oxygen. Uh, eastern basin really is characterized by cladophora issues. Um, and then in the Western Basin, it's, it's the cyanos that folks have already been talking about. And we also did see uh, localized blooms in the near shore as well uh, due to cyanobacteria. So um, that's uh, kind of setting the stage for how we tried to, to tackle this effort. So the targets we came up with um, are listed here, and I'm going to go through several versions of the slide to kind of hone in on, on some of the, the each of the specific basins. Um, it's important to note that uh, each of these basins work in concert, but not in isolation. So they're they're very much connected, and there is a relationship between them. The proposed targets were based on the best available science we had, and we we formed our our task team. Actually, I think it was. Um, 
2013. And so we really only had um, a, a year and a half to kind of get this work done. Um, so we brought together a whole variety of folks. And uh, at the end, I'll show you the, the list of folks who have been involved today. Um, um, I also want to bring to your attention that we do not have a target for the Eastern Basin. Um, unfortunately, the science uh, isn't um, at a place where we really can recommend um, reductions that we think are going to have an impact in the presence of uh, Cladophora in the lake. But uh, the good news is, is that there's a lot of work going on on um, Cladophora. Environment Canada has a, a decent amount of uh, research going on. And, as I understand it, they're hoping to wrap that up in the next several months. Um, we also, um, Dr. Reuter mentioned that there are 10 annex under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. One of them is the science annex, and we are going to uh, work with the science annex to uh, develop a, a plan and discuss the needs for Cladophora research um, into the future. So we've got a meeting set up this fall to start working on that. So I'm going to start with uh, recommendations in the central basin to address hypoxia. Uh, a reduction of 40% of the total annual phosphorus load to the central basin, um, including contributions from the western basin and the Huron-Erie Corridor. The Huron-Erie Corridor is uh, Lake St. Clair and uh, the St. Clair River and, and the Detroit River, um, would minimize hypoxia while maintaining the desired trophic state of the base of of these basins. So reducing the annual total phosphorus load to the central basin to 6,000 metric tons is our target. And that would raise the uh, summer, uh, late, average late summer um, dissolved oxygen concentration in the hypolimnemic zone to uh, concentrations around 2 um, milligrams per liter or higher. By reaching the goal, um, we expect to get the following benefits, reductions in internal phosphorus loading from sediments. Improvements in the benthic community and benefits to the drinking water intake uh, by reducing some of the taste and odor problems that occur due to heavy metals. And then reduction in cyanobacteria blooms in the central basin. In order to achieve the load reductions to meet the 6,000 metric tons, we're recommending a 40% reduction in the current loads from both Canada and the U.S. at a proportional rate proportional to what our contributions are. And um, as you might imagine, the U.S. has a larger contribution than Canada. Now I'm going to turn to the cyano uh, blooms in the Western Basin. Um, Non-point source runoff from the Maui River really um, during spring in particular is what drives and helps us predict what those um, uh, blooms are going to look like and the severity of blooms. Um, reducing the spring phosphorus loads uh, from the Maumee by 40% is expected to reduce the cyano in the western uh, basin to mild levels. For example, that observed in 2012, uh, nine years out of 10. So why 2012? In 2012, the amount of uh, toxic algae present in the western basin uh, was considered to be a mild bloom. Um, no significant cyanotoxin uh, related issues were, were identified except for a little bit in the inner bay. And it was therefore determined that this was a reasonable threshold uh, to limit, um, to focus our uh, target. And then why nine years out of 10? Um, well, today we a good example. Uh, in years with uh, extremely wet conditions uh, in the spring, uh, we're likely to see substantial algal blooms. Uh, despite our phosphorus reductions. And so our expectation is, is that we will uh, only be able to be successful likely nine years out of 10. I think that's really our hope. Um, as climate changes and continues to evolve, we may have to kind of go back and take a look at this. But that's our, that's our recommendation at the moment. And then um, finally, the, um, in the near shore, um, we had recommendations for achieving a healthy aquatic ecosystem in the near shore. That was one of the lake ecosystem objectives. So limiting the formation of cyanobacteria blooms um, is key to this um, lake ecosystem objective. So small, small blooms have uh, actually been observed at the mouths of um, several rivers, the Thames River in Canada, 
um, Leamington Tribes in Canada, and then uh, the Maui River, Raisin River, which is in Michigan, Portage River, Toussaint Creek, and then in the Central Basins, the uh, Sandusky River and um, Huron River. Um, neither the modeling nor the monitoring data was sufficient to generate uh, load response curves for these individual tributaries. However, the task team um, uh, felt as though that, that the, the Maumee really represents, uh, serves as a surrogate for these uh, streams. The same types of um, issues, non-point source contributions, uh, rain patterns, those sorts of things, are uh, happening in these watersheds as well. And so the expectation is, is that a 40% reduction in, this, uh, in these um, watersheds is going to be needed to address the near shore problems at the mouths of these rivers. And um, that would be a 40% reduction uh, of both total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus. And I forgot to mention that on the um, cyano uh, blooms in the Western Basin, the 40% reduction equates to a um, 860 metric ton load of total phosphorus from the Maumee and 186 metric ton load of um, dissolved reactive phosphorus from the Maumee. So this is just a map that shows where those priority watersheds are. Um, the Leamington, just uh, in case folks aren't aware, is that kind of fuchsia color below the um, long pink Thames River. The Thames discharges in the Saint, uh, Lake St. Clair and then flows down through Detroit River. The Leamington Tribs are interesting because that's the greenhouse area, um, agricultural area in Canada, and they're relatively small tributaries which have really quite significant um, concentrations of phosphorus, and so that's one of the reasons why those were um, selected, and it, it stands out as being a really tiny area, and that's why. So in terms of allocations, um, in, in order to achieve the annual 6,000 metric tons uh, of total phosphorus, um, we are recommending a, a proportional uh, a reduction in Canada and the U.S. Um, those allocations are going to be based on 2008 load. Um, uh, we know that the total phosphorus load in the Central Basin in 2008 was a little over uh, 9,500 metric tons. And so the team is currently confirming uh, what the um, relative contributions from each of the countries was in terms of load, and then that 40% reduction will be applied to those numbers. So consultation. We are currently um, in consultation. We started our consultation or public comment period um, right at the end of June. Um, we have an online engagement system, if you will, um, in a, a web page, and it can be accessed through uh, binational.net, and that is the, the website for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And if you're interested in just background information on the Water Quality Agreement, the other annexes that are uh, part of the agreement, um, you can find all that information there. Um, in addition, we're going to go out and have in-person in meetings with folks. On the web page, you can find some general information about um, the target. Um, an actual printable fact sheet, and then the uh, objectives and targets task team report. That is a report that uh, the task team that Jeff and, and Sandy George from Environment Canada um, co-chaired, um, and it has a lot more information on it about um, the science um, and how they came to those uh, decisions, including some summaries on the modeling efforts. Um, this, this slide is a little old. We, we have a started consultation, and our consultation in the U.S. is going to run through the end of August. Uh, in Canada, it's going to run through the end of July. There may be a little bit more consultation in August as well. Um, <coughs> when you go to binational.net, you'll have the opportunity to go either to the U.S. page or the Canadian page, and there's a series of questions we ask folks, and we're, we are interested in folks' input and feedback. So if you have any thoughts, Go there and give us some give us some input. Next thing I wanted to um, talk about briefly is um, cladophora. And as I mentioned mentioned pre previously, we're not at this time recommending targets for the eastern basin for cladophora. 
science uh, at this time is insufficient. However, there is research going on that is going to help uh, with uh, this, but um, I wanted to give a little background. Historically, overabundance of cladopera was um, intimately tied to phosphorus enrichment, generally associated with inputs of phosphorus with high biological availability. So uh, a dissolved reactive phosphorus from wastewater treatment plants in, 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 and industrial discharges. Current blooms are widespread in the lower Great Lakes, in Ontario, Erie, Michigan, and parts of Huron, and are most commonly found in low phosphorus environments with suitable habitat. So that the habitat would be a substrate, um, the, uh, hard substrate, and then light. With the exception of Lake Superior and parts of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. So those are the only areas that we haven't had uh, cladopera issues. There are a number of reasons um, and include the role of invasive species uh, as modifiers of nutrients, such as the mussels, um, physical habitat features, uh, such as substrate, light penetration, and nutrient recycling uh, capacity. Modeling cladophora growth in response to uh, phosphorus loads is challenging. It's important to note that the initial models were developed under environmental conditions that are significantly different. Um, the near shore waters are heavily impacted by new, uh, phosphorus enriched discharges from point sources, which is not the case so much anymore. Uh, compared to those experienced across much of the affected shoreline at present time, um, which uh, is influenced by a more complex mix, mix of phosphorus sources, including non-point source, offshore phosphorus, and phosphorus trapped in, and recycled uh, by expansive populations of the descended mussels that reside in the near shore. It's also important to consider that the model results are only as good as the data used to run the model, pretty common for all things. Um, a comparison of uh, the approaches undertaken in the Annex 4 phosphorus targets, where no phosphorus uh, targets were agreed on, uh, will be compared to an alternative approach um, that Environment Canada is currently uh, working on that demonstrates that um, the, um, the science, that tries to work through some of the science gaps and, and looks at uh, data issues. From a research perspective, Environment Canada is working to address the science, knowledge, and, uh, and knowledge gaps required to, de um, to deliver and inform phosphorus targets specific to cladophora for eastern Lake Erie. Research activities are summarized in the following three themes. Source tracking and apportionment to determine the, or the origin of SRP associated with nuisance blooms. This research recognizes that contemporary blooms may be driven by phosphorus inputs from watershed circulation of offshore waters, as well as the phosphorus translocation and recycling mediated by and mussels. This work will address science-based uh, targets to minimize bloom by improving our understanding of the specific sources of phosphorus currently fueling blooms in the near shore. The second is the use of molecular markers from material preserved in the lake sediment to reconstruct the historical bloom frequency and severity of cladophora in east base, eastern basin of Lake Erie, and to relate this to the phosphorus load. This will provide crucial information on major gaps in the historic data and information record and can loads on a basin or lake-wide basis to inform target development. And third, in situ measurement or modeling approaches to quantify phosphorus efflux um, from muscles, from muscle beds and their importance in both generating and maintaining SRP gradients in cladophora habitat. The information will be crucial for validating phosphorus rates in um, ecosystem models. Taken together, these research activities will improve the predictive capability uh, to develop um, a cladophora growth to phosphorus load response curves inform the and inform the, the development of draft phosphorus targets in the eastern basin of Lake Erie. To summarize, the cladophora research and modeling, which is supported through Canada's Great 
Great Lakes Nutrient Initiative will improve our understanding of phosphorus sources, important to, to stimulating phosphorus blooms, will improve the understanding of the magnitude of phosphorus recycling mediated by the mussels, and improve our understanding of the historic response of Cladophora to phosphorus management activities in Lake Erie since the 1980s. With these science gaps addressed, the ecosystem models currently in use can be improved and hopefully developed uh, to, to give us a better prediction of Cladophora um, response to um, phosphorus reduction. And this will enable us to actually set targets. One of the other things we are also talking about is taking a look at what's going on in the other lakes related to Cladophora. Ontario is likely the next lake we're going to start working on. So Lake Erie was the first lake. We have to run through all the lakes to, to set up nutrient um, uh, targets. And in Lake Ontario, they, they also have a, a big Cladophora problem. And um, a lot of the load is actually coming from Lake Erie. So there's going to be a big connection to that. In Lake Michigan, Cladophora is um, happening up on um, the Sleeping Bear Dunes area. Uh, I think it's related to some of the work that some of the um, things going on in Green Bay. And so um, we're going to try to connect the dots and see if we can figure out what some of the issues are that are causing these problems. So the next. Um, Nutrient Annex Subcommittee, we'll, uh, we'll, we're going to work with our, tar our partners to begin to develop the domestic action plans. Um, there's a lot of interest in what action there already is going on. So on the next slides, I'm going to just talk about some of those things. A lot of this stuff is related to um, work that either EPA or, I'm sorry, um, US, the US um, or Canada are, are um, already doing. Um, in um, the United States, uh, we have the Great Lakes um, Restoration Initiative, uh, which is a large funding source where we have been able to fund, um, expand monitoring, fund some BMPs uh, through the uh, agricultural program. Um, in Michigan, they have worked to um, actually reduce the um, the levels of uh, phosphorus in the Detroit wastewater treatment plant discharge. That is one of the largest dischargers on the Great Lakes. And it is the largest discharger on, Great, on the Great Lakes. And so over the years, they've um, actually gotten uh, Detroit to a place where they're discharging at uh, averaging 0.3 milligrams per liter, which um, I'm forgetting the actual uh, pounds reduction, but it, it's fairly significant. Um, in Ohio, they've done legislation recently that um, tries to um, direct how uh, agriculture is going to operate related to agriculture, uh, related to fertilizer and manure application. And um, in Indiana, they've got some interesting monitoring programs going on where they're trying to connect um, practices on the field with um, in-stream uh, reductions in phosphorus. In Canada, similarly, they've got um, some funding that they have that they've been able to do uh, additional monitoring. Ontario, um, they've worked with Canada to develop a, a, an agreement on how they're going to work together. Um, and then the conservation authorities, which is kind of like our NRCS, um, they go out and work with farmers to put BMPs in place. So uh, lots of things are going on in, in the area of um, action, but not enough to change, um, see significant changes. So the next step, consultation. We are going to um, consider the comments we get and um, make changes as appropriate. Um, the Great Lakes Executive Committee is the organization that uh, kind of manages the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. We're going to make a presentation to them in December of our final recommendations. And they have to be uh, finalized by February of 2016. <coughs> I already spoke about the allocations by country. So the next big task we have ahead is developing domestic action plans. The domestic action plans are actually the implementation plans for how we're going to actually achieve the 40% reduction. It's likely to be something that each jurisdiction, each state, 
um, each uh, department are going to have to figure out what actions they're going to take in um, both the United States and Canada. And then finally, these are the organizations that have been part of our subcommittee. Um, you'll notice all the states around um, Lake Erie, um, Ontario, agricultural departments, um, environmental departments, departments of natural resources, a whole collection of folks who have been part of this, NOAA. And then in addition to these folks, we have these different task teams who have actually brought in additional folks, a lot of universities, through uh, Jeff's work, Ohio State University, uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, um, Heidelberg College, and um, I'm forgetting, oh, University of Windsor in Canada have been some of the key uh, players that have been working on this. And then also Joe DePinto was one of the um, uh, key modelers who helped um, manage this as well. So that is our recommendation. Thanks very much, Jim. What I'm going to try to uh, real rapidly do is tell you a little bit about the science within the uh, Annex 4 task team that focused on the objectives and load. The science behind the numbers that Tinka gave you, and then we'll take questions for both of us at the end. And I'm going to move uh, very rapidly through these. Uh, Again, focusing on uh, uh, adaptive management throughout, and this is critical. Uh, as Tinka indicated, each of you, the students in the room, you can comment. You can go to binational.net and you can see the report that will outline everything that I'm going to summarize for you today. And in that report, you're going to see the term adaptive management. What does this mean? Because each of you, as you move into potentially jobs with state or federal agencies, are going to hear this again and again because it's the way we are likely going to do business in the future. We've made a recommendation, as Tinka said, of a target for the Maumee River in the spring of a load of 860 tons. Best science we have tells us that that's the number that we should shoot for. As we take action on the land, as we change the actions of farmers, the behavior of farmers, we're going to start moving down toward that 860 number. We need to be monitoring to determine are the actions we're taking effective. If we have a buffer strip or a cover crop initiative that should reduce phosphorus loading by 10%, does it really do that? Does it do 10% on every kind of soil? Does it do 10% on every uh, land elevation or the slope of the field? Uh, or does it only work on flat or only hilly ground, et cetera? But also, we need to be looking at the 40% reduction or the target of 860, and as we get closer to it, decide when we get down to a reduction of, say, we're down to 1,000 tons, how's the lake look? Maybe we're satisfied with the load of 1,000 rather than 860. Or once we get to 860, we look at the lake and we say, this is not far enough we've got to go to a reduction of 750. Uh, that's what adaptive management means. It allows us to take action right now with the best available science, but then as we move toward that goal, continue to evaluate and decide if that is a satisfactory goal. Uh, you'll have that again and again. Real quickly, we're focused on four things, Western Basin, harmful algal blooms, Central Basin, dead zones, Eastern Basin, Cladophora, and then the small blooms at the mouths of tributaries and the near shore. Those were the biggies for us. For the goal for harmful algal blooms, we wanted to produce a bloom that was smaller or equal to the bloom. You're going to see up there 2004 and 2012. The reason I did that, I didn't explain this to the media today. 2004 models perfectly. Uh, the 860 target works really well for 2004, and it produces a particular biomass of algae. 2012, that's a year that everybody remembers. The bloom of 2012 is almost identical to the bloom of 2004, but if I said the bloom of 2004, nobody remembers what 2004 looks like. 2012 they remember, but quite frankly, 2012 doesn't model as well. 
So we put the two in there together. We want to have a bloom that looks like that nine years out of ten. We use 2008 as our base year. Why do you choose 2008? Remember Tinka said we want to get a bloom that looks like 2012 or better, nine years out of ten. So what you do is you pick a year that has a very, very large discharge. It's a year where the discharge is so big that a discharge that big would only be exceeded one year out of ten. If you can reduce the load that comes in during that big discharge year to an acceptable level, then you could say, all right, if we can do it during a big year like that, we should be able to hit that nine years out of ten, and therefore we would be, be successful. So that 860 target is based on the load from 2008, which is a big discharge year. And we focused on the Maumee River because it became really clear that we've got a lot of great information about that. The data is the most reliable. And when we look at the Maumee, it's the one that, w that accurately predicts the severity of the bloom, particularly when we look at the load from 1 March to 31 July. Target load, 860 tons for, for total, 186 tons for the soluble re or dissolved reactive. But it's important to, to take the total discharge volume for that year and divide it by the load of phosphorus, and you're going to get a milligram per liter. But we want a flow weighted mean concentration. And that's what our task team recommends that we, we follow. If you want to know, for instance, if I simply looked at the load, and next year we have a drought year, like we had in 2012, and the load goes down to 500 tons, hey, we declare victory, we solved the problem. We, we have to be looking at that flow-weighted mean concentration. So irregardless of how big the discharge is, we can determine if the best management practices are actually reducing the amount of, of, of phosphorus that's coming off the field. So the target is 0.23 milligrams for total phosphorus and 0.05 for the soluble, and that's a 40% reduction on what came out of the Maumee in 2008. We also, when we look at the nearshore, because the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement said you have to also look at nearshore, not just the basins, we could see, and I'll show you a slide at the end, at the very end, I'll show you a slide that, that literally shows you how you can see from satellite the blooms at the mouths of each one of these tributaries. So those became the priority tributaries that Tinka mentioned in the Annex 4 report. We could identify those blooms at the mouths of those tributaries, so we recommended the 40% reduction. We also believe that those tributaries contrib uh, contribute to the total load for the basin. And again, we recommended focusing on and, and tracking the flow-weighted mean concentrations. For hypoxia, occurs in the western basin. You can also reduce hypoxia by reducing the amount of phosphorus that goes in. When you think about it, the giant bloom of 2011, I'll show you a picture, you've probably seen it already, or Dr. Beatty has talked about it, or the students have studied it in the REUs. That bloom moved into the central basin and then it sunk to the bottom. All that had to be decomposed. That uses up oxygen. Therefore, if we can reduce the size of the bloom, we'll also reduce the oxygen consumption rates in the central basin, the cold water water bottom layer or the hypolimnion. P loading to the central basin, the area between Sandusky and Erie, that comes from the western basin and the central basin. If we reduce it and the target, if we can reduce the load to a dissolved oxygen concentration that results in a dissolved oxygen concentration of two milligrams per liter, that was the science. That's what we wanted to do. You know, we could have picked any number. We could have set a target, let's reduce the size of the area of anoxia by 50%, or let's reduce the duration of the anoxic period in half. There's really no science there. Why did I pick 50%? I could have picked 40, I could have picked 60. We chose to pick a reduction 
that would raise the dissolved oxygen concentration in that bottom layer to at least two milligrams per liter. I'm going to explain to you why in just a second. Uh, we focus on the annual load. For the harmful algal blooms, we focused on spring. For uh, uh, hypoxia, we focused on the load during the whole year. We used 2008 as the base. When we looked at harmful algal blooms, we used three models. The forecast that we gave this morning uses four models now. We've added a fourth. When we look at hypoxia, we used six additional models. We felt very confident all six models <coughs> agreed that if we could reduce the load to the central basin to 6,000 tons, the target that <coughs> Tinker recommended, that the average DO in that cold bottom layer would be above two milligrams per liter. Down here, theoretically, if you keep the average DO in the water above two milligrams per liter, you'll maintain oxygen in the surface layer of sediment. If you maintain oxygen in the surface layer of sediment, you will greatly reduce the recycling or internal loading of phosphorus from the sediment. So if we could hit that target of two milligrams per liter, we'll give a, get a, a double bang for our buck reduce the load of phosphorus coming in from the external sources, will also release, reduce the release of phosphorus from the bottom sediments. 6,000 tons was a 40% reduction. Uh, and again, we're focused on the western basin and the central basin. So here are the blooms. I told you before about the big bloom from 2011. So essentially, all this biomass that formed this bloom is going to sink to the bottom and contribute to that uh, the oxygen depletion. You see 2012, this becomes our target. We'd like to have a bloom that would look like that or less nine years out of ten. All right. What we did here, just to give you an idea of how this would look, this is uh, total phosphorus uh, coming in, but we've, we're looking at flow weighted mean concentrations. So over here you see an average, three-year running average for the flow weighted mean concentration our target is 0.23 milligrams per liter. That's the black line right here. You see we're up here right now. So if we look at the result of that, over here, we, we're, we're seeing the target in tons. We're looking at a target of 860 tons. And you see each year. So in 2000, the gray bar in each case is what actually came in. We had about 1,000 tons come in in 2000. If we had a flow weighted mean concentration of 0.23, the target, we would have put in about 600 tons. 600 tons is well below our target of 860. We wouldn't have had, we actually would have had a very, very tiny bloom this year. If you look at 2008, this is the year that we base all our predictions on. So we have a load in 2008 of about 1,500 tons. If we reduce that down by 40%, we hit our 860. So this tells you what the model is. This gives you a bloom that would look like 2012. That's what each of these does. So down here in uh, 2011, we have this giant bloom. You know, 2,400 tons comes in that year. Uh, if we reduce that by 40%, we're still putting in about 1,200. So this particular year, we're going to have a bloom that looks worse than 2012. That's the way this forecast works. And I'll show you a couple more things here. Same thing with soluble reactive. You get an impact. You see what the reduction does, the reduction of 40%. Another view of how this might look in sort of to the, to the eye. 2008 bloom, 2011 bloom, 2012 bloom. 2008's our base year. So if we reduce a 40% reduction takes this bloom and makes it look like that. 40% reduction here gives you no bloom. A 40% reduction in this giant one from 2011 makes it look like 2008. What we'd like to have happen is we end up with blooms that look like this or less nine years out of 10 when we have the year that produces a bloom that looks like that. 
we make it look like this, but hopefully we get blooms that look like this not more than one year out of ten. Where we are right now, uh, through the uh, end of June, we've already put in 1,586 tons. And this is the result of the month of June. Look what happened. This is the end of May and then June. Huge rainfall, just an unbelievable load that went in. 40% reduction right now would give us 897, but we've got to go till the end of July. We've got more time and it's still raining. Uh, if we look at soluble reactive, it's the same way. Here's the end of May, and then look what happened. We're at 396. We're almost up to the load. Why We have a big, well, I'll tell you a little bit more here in a second. Okay, so uh, Justin showed a slide early. You see the 2011 bloom, 2013, 2014. Our forecast right now for 2015 is a bloom that looks like this. It's going to be a big one. If we had a 40% reduction, it would take us, if we were successful with that, getting down to that flow weighted mean, we'd have a bloom that would look like that. Okay? Gives you an idea of what to expect. Okay, now if we look from satellite, you can see in early July, what we've done here is take the five worst bloom years and created a composite of where those blooms start. Remember, we were focused on the near shore, and so we're looking at near shore areas, and do we see localized blooms occurring in the near shore at the mouths of the tributaries? Well, obviously, you have one here. One of the things you ought to also be able to pick up is that Sandusky Bay, where some of you are working right now, and what, how did Justin describe Sandusky Bay? Cesspool. Cesspool. Uh, Justin, I wouldn't use that terminology outside this room. <laughs> It's, it's obviously nutrient-rich, maybe a better way of <laughs> describing it, right? because there's a giant bloom there all the time. Uh, so in early July, you can see the blooms on the near shore. You can see where the, the for instance here, the Portage River comes out at Port Clinton. You see a bloom right on the uh, west side of Catawba Island from, from the Portage. You can see where the two saint and the various tributaries come out here. You can watch these blooms grow. This is where uh, Monroe comes in. Remember, uh, Tinka focused on the uh, Leamington tributaries. Here's the Leamington tributaries up here. Very, very small tributaries. Very small load, but the concentration coming out of those tributaries is over 1,000 milligrams per liter. They drain agricultural greenhouses. Uh, you go to uh, end of July, bloom picking up. What you see here at the end of July See this right here? This is where the Monroe, th the Monroe Thermal Power Plant uh, is right here. You have a giant thermal discharge. What do blue-green algae, cyanobacteria need? High concentrations of phosphorus and warm water. And obviously you can see that again there and, and you see the blooms grow. And then this is where I'm going to stop. A couple things to say about this. What this one does is look at the top contributors, the top loaders. So if we're going to identify what are the priority tributaries, this is a helpful one. This is 2008 data. Green bars are what comes in from what we call the connecting channel. So we really don't call the Detroit River a river. It's a connecting channel between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. The Detroit River in 2008 put in 2,040 tons. The Maumee River in 2008 put in 3,800 tons. The Detroit River brings in, to the western basin, the Detroit River brings in 94% of the volume of water. 94% of the water comes in out of this river, brings in 2,000 tons. 4% of the water that comes in, out of the, comes in out of the Maumee brings in 3,800 tons. Maumee is very, very highly concentrated with phosphorus. This is the source of your problem right here. Next highest, next highest loader, next highest river for all the Great Lakes is the Sandusky River. Brings in 1,100 tons. This number, the 3,800 for the Maumee, varies from about 2,300 during a real dry year up to about 4,200. So whenever anybody shows you a number for a river and they say, here's what the load is, you got to ask them what year that was and are you talking the annual year, January 1st to the end of March, or are you talking the water year? 
October 1 to the end of September. Uh, the other thing is, if you look here, and I, this is an important thing to keep in mind, and this is where I'm going to end this talk. Uh, Tinka said that our target load, and you'll find this in our committee report, task team report, target, target load for this basin is 6,000 tons. That means the whole, the whole load that comes in out of this basin and into this basin can't exceed 6,000 tons. In 1969, we put in 29,000 metric tons of phosphorus into Lake Erie. Our models told us first, in fact, the first target that most people miss now, and, and I have often forgotten about it, the first target that we came up with was 14,600. So we went from 29,000, we said, let's get down to 14,600. We got down there and we thought we didn't like that, and we reduced that to 11,000. So right now, in everybody's mind, we have a target of 11,000 tons. If we reduce the load to the central basin to 6,000 tons, then you see going into the eastern basin, there's not very much that goes in here. If we reduce the load to the central basin to 6,000, that means that the total load to Lake Erie is under 7,000. So we have then gone from 29,000 to a targeted load of 14,000 to a targeted load of 11,000. What we're really saying now is that we ought to have a target of less than 7,000. <coughs> Why might that be? And the, big, the biggest reason for this is that the amount of dissolved reactive phosphorus that is coming into the lake has gone up by 144%. The total amount, we're still hitting many, many years, we still hit the 11,000 target. But in that 11,000 target, the dissolved reactive component has gone up 144%. The dissolved reactive component is 100% bioavailable. The particulate phosphorus component is 25 to 50 percent bioavailable. So if you quickly do the math, a target of 7,000 with an increase in 140, of 144 percent in the DRP or the dissolved reactive, which is four times more bioavailable than the particulate, they're almost the same. The big reason is the change in the dissolved reactive. With that, I'm going to stop. Uh, we've gone a little bit over, Chris. Uh, Tinkin, and I can stay up here for questions. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think we should take a couple of questions before we wrap things up. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Actually, let's thank our two speakers. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to make you back to this slide real quick. You just mentioned 1969 with the 22. 29,000. Was there a balloon there? Yeah. Huge balloon. Okay. Huge balloon. A little bit before my time. So, um, I missed the <laughs> 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 Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this is why, perfect. Probably one you go to. So, this, this, the gray area, this range, is this showing the maximum ever recorded? Uh, what this, yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, remember those images? Uh, so, uh, gray area represents at the top is the load that went in this year when we had the biggest bloom in history, and at the bottom is the load that went in that year in 2012. Okay. So I'll go back to the slide for a second. <clears throat> so we've seen the uh, large increase here, uh, almost 1,000. So now if we go to the satellite data slide you had later. No, the one with the, uh, the oh, oh, the jump, there we go. So I guess, you know, given the loading is coming in so late this year, you know, and, and I heard someone earlier, I guess, mention it, starting to see it, I guess, can we project that because of the late loading and the fact that, you know, we're all right into 9th of July and we're not seeing this kind, that we're going to have less of a bloom than we're projecting because the time will come later in the year? Oh, great question. Uh, and uh, Tom Bridgman, is sampling in Maumee Bay. Uh, uh, Tim Davis from Tom Bridgman, uh, University of Toledo. Tim Davis from NOAA Lurl. 
It also has a number of sensors out. Justin's out all around. The, so Justin, am I right? You're not seeing big concentrations of microcystis or anything like that. You are seeing a little bit. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit. So you see a scum come up. There's, a there's reports all the way to here on a decent amount two weeks ago already. Yeah. Right. Oh, but all right. the data is not saying it's not jump level. I mean, this is from Monty Bay. It's all right in early July. Right. right. And, in, and during the worst bloom. So if you look at early July right here, this is where we'd see that. Okay. And this Tom Bridgman is already seeing blooms in Maumee Bay. And actually, a little earlier than what would be normal is what what Tom is seeing this year. Yeah. So, for another like question, and I'm an engineer, I may be the only engineer in here, but um, I'm familiar obviously with the Western, but you're talking about the Eastern Basin Bloom and the uh, whatever. Split opera. Yeah. So, can you, make, can you contrast the characteristics of the Eastern with the what is it similar? I mean, I'm familiar with the Western, but I just don't remember seeing the, the big difference. The, the Go ahead, Rich. The, this is these are this planktonic algae, uh, meaning that it's suspended within the water column, and the Cladophora is a, a benthic form of algae that's attached to the bottom, and and it's not a blue It doesn't produce toxins. The, the challenge for us, we know, if we if we reduce the load, I'll give you exact numbers. If we reduce the load to 6,000 tons to the central basin, that's obviously going to have an impact on the eastern basin, because all that water is going to move to the eastern basin. And it reduces the open lake concentration of phosphorus in the eastern basin by one milligram per liter. We know that's going to have a positive impact on the amount of Cladophora, but we don't we can't measure the size uh, how big of a reduction are we going to see because of that. And the reason is that we, when we look at Cladophora growth, we don't know how much it's driven by the open lake concentration of phosphorus versus the load from the tributaries along the shoreline. And, and right now, the models are not good enough to help us figure that out. So, if, these, so if, it, if that's not a toxin producer, I guess what's, I think it has a nuisance? It has a nuisance and it, it follows the beaches and that as it decomposes you get bacteria and um, types of things that can cause human health problems. And that is your I have a, a two part, two, I don't know if it's two part. One, I'm a, one I'm a double <laughs> barrel question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one uh, is Well, I guess the, the the first question is, you know, is this cyanobacteria problem having an impact on uh, walleye and purse populations? And then, if we get this reduction in phosphorus loads, what is that going to do to walleye and perch populations? Uh, great question, because that gets back to the bottom uh, ecosystem objective that Tinker referred to, which is you know maintaining the right trophic conditions within each one of the basins, uh, and the 6,000 ton target load to the central basin, in some ways, is going to produce slightly a, a, a number slightly less than what we'd like to have for a concentration, but it's going to put dissolved oxygen back into the cold bottom layer. And we think that the positive impact on the habitat is going to be more beneficial than the reduction in the amount of phosphorus. But it's answering questions like that that exact, is exactly why you also have the adaptive management focus. And the Great Lakes Fishery Commission fully supports these numbers as long as we have an adaptive management. <laughs> yeah, as long as you can go back and review, right? Yeah, as long as we can keep looking at it, make sure we haven't gone too far, which is really what you're questioning. Yeah. And, and to add on to that a little bit, too, there's a lot of research currently going on, specifically at Ohio State, out of Stu Ludd's lab with the Aquatic Ecology Lab, looking at the effects of also the, the vision effects of fish that reside in the people, too. And so 
their ability to forage within these blooms and how efficient they are foraging within the blooms. So they're seeing, seeing growth rates in things like white perch because they have a better ability to forage in these blooms than something yeah. like a, yeah. a yellow perch or one. Yeah. So there's there's some other effects there too as the water clarity changes, not just changing the, the, the dynamics of the yeah. web, but just visual acuity. Thanks very much. Real quickly, we'll pull up the slide for the next. So, of course, uh, we have another next Thursday will be our next set of lectures. Um, and so, we have Dr. Uh, Carolyn Whitaker. She's coming from the uh, Ohio State University. She's actually who Jeff and I have historically reported to. So, this is my boss at the university, or one of my two bosses at the university. So, she's the vice president for research. Um, and then the research brief to be announced, we filled that with. <coughs> There should be a name there, and I don't know why there isn't. Oh, Jay Martin. That's uh, July 16th, correct? Is that what this date is? Yeah, it is, Jay. Yep, so that's Dr. Jay Martin, and he'll be here speaking. He's got a great social science spin on some of the harmful algal bloom work that's going on, too. So giving a real read on what, what things like what, what the farmers are thinking about these blooms and, and their activities. Thanks, everybody, for tonight, and uh, have a good evening.